we're coming to you really to talk about this change in oncology. So the practice of oncology is undergoing a transformation. It's got to be obvious to anybody in this field. Um, and the question is why? And it's what I consider this paradigm, this new paradigm that the immune system is the agent that improves outcome and cures people with metastatic solid cancer. I, I don't use that word lightly. And it's not that the immune system works alone. Um, it certainly is an adjunct to standard of care, whether that be chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. But if patients don't have their immune system turned on, they are unlikely to do well. And so this represents a fundamental shift in our understanding of cancer uh, and how the body works. This is controversial, <clears throat> but the concept of cure um, is something that the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer has been also promoting, and it's based not just on these latest agents, but on the fact that once a patient obtains a, a durable, complete, or complete response with immunotherapy, and it's highlighted with interleukin-2, that a patient can remove, uh, remain in complete remission for decades, so the follow longest follow-up approaching 30 years on patients who are received IL-2. It's not just the immunotherapy community that has recognized this, but this guy as well. Uh, this is Mr. Jim Cramer, um, and he's got a program called Mad Money with uh, Jim Cramer on MSNBC. This is not a paid political advertisement. But, but if you search Jim Cramer and search that slide of ASCO, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, you'll find this slide, which he recognized as being an important change or shift. And that is comparing immunotherapy and targeted therapy uh, for the treatment of melanoma. And if you look to the right-hand side here on the targeted therapy, the good news is that essentially every patient um, has benefit um, with targeted therapy. The, 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 the bad part is that those patients go on and recur, and they appear to be coming back to the same same point. And, and from this slide, that was actually, it's the work of Tony Rebus, but which was presented by my colleague here, Walter Urba. Um, he com contrasted that with where we are with immunotherapy. While very few people actually respond to immunotherapy, in this rate we're showing about the 22% rate for ipilimumab, that the patients who do respond can have durable responses that can be long-lived. And so this is really the contrast. The contrast is lots of patients responding, but a, a relatively short duration versus few patients responding in long duration as a first point of principle. This was the second slide in that series that were presented at ASCO last year. And it's more of a hypothetical slide, but it's taking the data from ipilimumab, for instance, being at the 20% rate or response rate in people being long-term alive versus that of, of PD-1, which may be between that 20 to 30 percent rate as well. And then looking at the combination, which was presented by Jed Wolchek last year, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing about a 53 percent objective response rate in, in a select cohort of small number of patients. But the concept is that you've got two immunotherapies that are not cytotoxic agents that are working solely to their impact on the immune system, and they're leading to objective responses in what appear to be, at least at this point, um, having some duration. So it was that data, as well as data from uh, an adoptive T-cell immunotherapy, the work of, of, of Stephen Rosenberg at the National Cancer Institute, and colleagues, and that of Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania, and, and his colleagues um, with the very exciting and, and uh, therapeutic effects that they're seeing with adoptive immunotherapy, as well as the data with, PD, with checkpoint blockade with anti-PD-1 and PDL one and things like ipilimumab, which led science to identify 2013 as being, as cancer immunotherapy being the breakthrough of the year. So it's, it's becoming well recognized by the community uh, that, that immunotherapy is going to play an important role, it's already playing an important role in cancer treatment. So let's step back a little bit now in terms of trying to visualize how this works. So we believe that, that the majority of the population probably developed cancer at some point over their lifetime. And that's the result of, of exposure to carcinogens, radiation, viral infections, chronic inflammation, or inherited genetic mutations, or combinations of those. 
the transformation of normal cells leads to their expression of novel antigens. These novel antigens can be mutated proteins, but they could also be short-lived proteins or, de or defective ribosomal products um, that are overexpressed. Those transformed cells will also release danger signals, which will trigger the adaptive and innate immune cells to lead to the elimination of these transformed cells. And in patients where this elimination is complete, that those patients will essentially not be identified or diagnosed with cancer. But it's those patients where the immune response either does not develop or where the immune cells escape uh, that, that they're, they're identified as having cancer. And this equilibrium effect, which, which these elimination, equilibrium, and escape are the, are the three E's or the triple E um, hypothesis of, of Bob Schreiber from this review in science. This escape can happen as a result of antigen loss or, or major histocompatibility loss, antigen loss, which leads to the inability of the immune system to see and detect the immune cells. Or it can be due to suppressive mechanisms that the tumor can express, um, things like PDL1, which can trigger uh, the, the, the senescence or the, um, the death of T cells that express, activated T cells that express PD1 but also other agents like TGF-beta or, or, or IDO that can suppress the immune, the immune response. So if we come back to this step, the elimination step, is there evidence that this happens with human tumors? Because there's lots of data in the mouse that shows that that happens. But can then we show that it happens in humans? 